Okay, welcome back. This is Software Carpentry. And in the next hour or so, I'm going to try to show you what I think is the single most important tool the scientist should use when doing any kind of computational research. The tool is called version control. Now, I'm going to show you a version control system called Subversion. It's been around for more than 10 years. It's widely used, but these days it's gradually being replaced by newer systems called Git and Mercurial. And we'll do another tutorial like this showing you how to use Git at some point in the future. Regardless of which system you're using, the key ideas stay the same. So let me explain the problem that version control is meant to solve, why the things you're probably doing right now aren't actually good solutions, and then explain how version control solves them, and then I'll show it to you in action. And the whole thing will take about an hour. Here's the problem. In the average week, I probably work on four different computers. I have my own laptop. I have a computer at home set up in the office with a nice big screen and a full-sized keyboard. And then I have two machines in the office because I need to test everything I do on Mac, Linux, and Windows. Now, you might have your personal laptop and then the departmental servers, and then there might be a computer at your parents' place or your partner's place, something like that. You need to move files back and forth between all of these. You work for a weekend on a machine here you copy your files onto USB or mail them to yourself. You go to a machine there and you discover that you don't have all the files you need. Or, what's worse, you copy these files, you move over, you forgot that on that computer you'd done a little bit of work Friday, and now you overwrite it by copying files off that USB or plopping them out of your mail, and now you've lost a few hours work. You run into exactly the same problems when you're trying to collaborate with other people. If you're working with Grace Hopper and Alan Turing. You're co-authoring a paper on computational methods in population ecology. You're going to have data files, scripts, and the actual source of the paper itself, the Word or LaTeX or whatever it is file. If you are mailing different versions back and forth and trying to merge everything by hand, you all know what happens. Sooner or later, somebody loses something that somebody else did or overwrites something that somebody else did. Exactly the same thing happens if you're using a file sharing system like Dropbox. Yes, it's cloud accessible, but you still have to manually keep track of who did what, who's writing what, where's the most recent version, do I have all the files that I need. One way to avoid this that older version control systems use is to take turns. If you're collaborating with Alan Turing and Grace Hopper, you say, today I'm the only one who's allowed to write to any of these files, and when I'm done, it becomes Alan's turn. When he's done, it becomes Grace's turn, and then it becomes my turn again. Well, this is very inefficient. At any given point, two-thirds of your team is twiddling their thumbs. You could say, well, Grace is working on just the first third of the paper, I'm working on the middle third, and Alan's working on the conclusion in the bibliography, but that doesn't work either. Sooner or later, Alan's going to need to change something in the middle of the paper to reflect changes in the bibliography, and you're back to the merge problem. Version control is the solution. It's been around for decades. It works very well. It's fairly straightforward, and it's widely used by professional programmers, so much so that many places won't even interview you unless you know how to use a version control system. If you do a Google for the Joel test, you'll find a list of questions that a very famous developer, Joel Spolsky, says you can use to judge how mature, how professional a software team is. And one of those questions is, do you use version control? If the answer is no, you just move on to your next candidate. Here's the basic idea. This is me, and this is you. Neither of us owns the master copy of the files that we're working with. Instead, there's a separate master copy on a server somewhere out in there in the cloud. Neither of us can edit it directly. We both have copies of the master. Now, I go ahead and I make changes to my copy of the master, and when I'm finished, I push those changes to the master on the server. And the master, the version control system on the master, looks at my changes, looks at what it's got, and says, yes, I'll accept these. You can then ask the version control system, please give me the most recent set of changes. You don't need to know which files have been changed or where the changes have been made. 
you just need to go to the master and say, please, can I have them? And you'll get updated. Now, so far, this just sounds like FTP or Dropbox. Here's where the magic comes in. Suppose that you and I are both editing the same file at the same time. We're both updating the bibliography for this paper. One or the other of us will finish first and push our changes up to the master. So let's imagine that it's me. I go to the master copy and I say to the version control system, here are my changes, and it says, sure. Now my version has become the master. It's been copied from my working copy on my machine up to the master. You come along and say, I would like to push my changes to the master. The version control system can detect that your changes would overwrite mine. It detects the conflict and says, no, no, you're not allowed to do that. You've changed things that somebody else has already changed. There's overlap between your work and my work. Therefore, you're not allowed to push those. Instead, before you can push your changes, you have to pull from the master copy to get what everybody else has done, merge it with your work, and then you can push back up. So nothing ever gets lost. You could pull my changes, look at them, and say, well, I don't like what Greg has done, I'll keep mine. Or you could say, what Greg has done is better than what I was doing, I'll keep Greg's. Or you could mix the two, or you could write something entirely new. That's up to you, but a human being has to make that decision about how to merge these two conflicting set of changes. Once that's happened, then and only then can you push up to the master. Now this scales to thousands or tens of thousands of people. Projects like Mozilla, the Firefox browser, Linux, the operating system, and commercial projects you've never heard of that are much larger, all rely on version control. You can safely work at your own speed on any part of the software, and when you're done, go and say, all right, have I fallen out of date with other people's changes to the master? If so, let me grab those, merge with what I've done, fix any conflicts on my machine before they infect the rest of the world, and then push it back up to the master. There are a couple of things that can go wrong, but they all reflect deeper underlying problems in how the project is being run. For example, suppose that I make a change and push it to the master. You then download it, look at it, and say, ah, I don't like the way Greg did this, I'm going to keep mine, and you push your changes to the master to overwrite mine. Conscious decision on your part. I then look at your push and say, actually, I preferred it my way. So I grab yours, put my changes back on top, and push that to the master. So we're each overwriting each other's work over and over again. I've actually seen this happen in projects. This is not a technological problem. Okay? This is two people who really need to sit down with a grown-up and have a conversation. Similarly, suppose we've got 100 people working on a paper. It sounds like an outrageous number, but there are papers in physics, in particle physics, for example, that have many hundreds of authors. I work on the bibliography. I've got my changes. I'm ready to push them, but I notice that somebody else has got there first. So I download their changes, do the merge, but while I'm doing the merge, somebody else has pushed their changes to the master. So now when I try to push mine, I'm out of date again. So I download the most recent set and do the edit, but damn it, while I'm doing that edit, a third person has pushed their changes to the master. This is called a race condition. It's a race to see who can get in. And I'm being starved. I never get a chance to push my changes because in the minutes it takes me to update to reflect recent changes that other people have put in, somebody else gets in again. Again, this is not a technological problem. This is a social problem. People in the team need to have a discussion. Something else that you will find is that if you're working on part of a program and you try to push your changes up to the master and it seems like every time you do, you're conflicting with Jane's changes and every time Jane tries to push, she's conflicting with yours. What's happened is there's not a clear division of responsibility. Who is supposed to be writing this part of the code? Who is supposed to be writing this part of the paper? Again, you need to sit down and figure out who's supposed to be doing what. And again, the technology here is highlighting the problem, but it's not the source of the problem. So that's the theory of version control. The work cycle is get the most recent version in case things have changed overnight or while you were on another project. Just make sure your starting point is up to date. Make your changes, add a function, change a function, run some analysis, whatever it is you do. When you've got something that is ready to share with the rest of the world because it works, push it up to the master. 
If you try to push and what your starting point was is now out of date, you'll be told. So you have to do another download to make sure that just before you push, you're up to date. If there are any conflicts with things that other people have done, you'll have to merge them on your machine so that the only breakage is there on your machine. Everybody else can continue working. And once you've got things consistent again, then you can finally do the upload. All of this is covered in the slideshow that's in the introductory section of the version control tutorial online. And they have pictures instead of hand waving, which might make it a little easier to follow. What we're going to do now is actually walk through this work cycle. And the last thing I'll say before we do that is that you need to remember what I said previously about how long you can work before your brain gets fatigued. You can go for about an hour concentrating and then your attention will start to flag. That means that when you're doing something with a version control system, you should try to size your work so that you've got about an hour's worth of work that you can do and check and reconcile with other people's changes and then you push up to version control. That becomes the natural rhythm of your day. You take a look at your long-range goal and you say, all right, what's the next self-contained hour's worth of work that I can do? You do that, you make sure it's right, you push it, you go and you have your break, grab one of these. That way, everything you do is broken up into chunks that are digestible because it's not enough to fit the work into the hour. When other people are collaborating with you and want to see what you've done, when they have to reconcile their changes with yours or understand why you did things, they need to be able to read through your changes in less than an hour, otherwise their brain will get fatigued. So if they can't review your work in under an hour, it's not going to be as useful. And so when you look at a version control system, you will often see that when people are developing new code, there's this regular sort of rhythm. Every hour to two hours, you will see them checking in the next change. And one of the side benefits of this is it means that everything is reviewable. It's readable and reviewable in about that same time. Okay, so let's dive in.